The usher may begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Denise Valladares, and I would like to welcome each one of you to today's conference. Today, it is with great honor and excitement that I introduce the next presenter. We will be talking about collaboration, communication, and critical thinking, the benefits of literature circles. Isis Pamela Rodriguez Lopez is a graduate of a double master's degree in TESOL and foreign languages, literatures, and cultures from Southern Illinois University, USA. With eight years of experience, she has taught English and Spanish language courses at the university level. She is currently an instructor in the language teaching department at UPNFM, where she teaches courses on English language, literature analysis, and language didactics. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Isis Pamela Rodriguez Lopez. The stage is yours. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us in this session. I'm very excited to be here and share a little bit of what I've done in uh, not only my literature classes, but also in uh, language level classes as well. We're going to talk about literature circles, which is uh, um, an activity that you have probably heard about before, or maybe you have used before. However, it's not very common. Um, in Honduras, so I decided to implement this at a higher education level, even though it was originally thought for um, middle schoolers. Okay, so let's begin by um, talking about what literature circles are. These are like a version of book clubs. Uh, they are reading and discussion groups led by students in which participants have thoughtful discussions about a selected book or material. As I said, it's like a, like a school version of uh, book clubs. Um, the difference is that in literature circles, we have students have specific roles and they know what their tasks are before they have the discussion. So within the literature circle, these um, um, participants or students have roles such as summarizers, discussion director, connector, researcher. This varies a lot. It would depend on um, what, what your audience is, like what level they have. It, it can work for children, it can work for teenagers, it can work for adult learners. So it would just depend on who your students are and what you want to do in your class. So through engaging discussions that involve deeper comprehension of the text, we seek to promote collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. And as I discuss what we do in literature circles, uh, you will see that there are more than these benefits. There are a lot of benefits in using literature circles. So um, I encourage everyone to, um, to use literature circles regardless of the level you teach. So I'd like to talk about uh, literature circles specifically at UPN. As I said, I've used literature circles in my um, universal literature class, uh, and I've used shorter versions of literature circles in my English level language courses, and you will see why. So um, when, I, when I use them in my literature classes, they are long-term projects. That means uh, they, the literature circles last for the whole term. So we have groups of four people that uh, have different roles every week in the discussions. Um, they have weekly meetings. Um, we usually have the meetings on Thursdays and we have them in class so that I can monitor uh, how those meetings are going and in case students have any questions, I'm there to address them. Um, students also provide weekly reports where they share the most important points of their um, discussions. And then at the end of the term, they, um, they do a project defense. And we're going to have a sample of a project defense today. Two of my students are joining us today to give us a sample. All right. So I want to talk about the specific roles I've used in class, student roles. We have the summarizer, discussion director, connector, vocabulary wizard. I thought giving it a, an interesting name would be also motivating for students. So vocabulary wizard and the literary luminary. 
Um, so I instruct students to rotate these roles every week. In that sense, in that way, everybody in the group gets to have all the roles at some point. So they can contribute in different ways in the discussions every week. Okay, so what the summarizer does, as you can imagine, <laughs> prepares a summary. It should be a two or three minute summary of the reading assignment for the week. And it should include key points, main highlights, and the general idea of that reading assignment. So the reading assignment can be uh, a short story. The reading assignment, uh, as I do in my classes, um, is usually a portion of the book they're reading. So say, mm, well, we're going to be having these discussions for six weeks. So I ask students to divide their book in six parts. And so the reading assignment would be the part that they decided to read for that week. So I say, for example, if your book has 12 chapters, then you should read two chapters every week and then have your, your discussion. If your book has 24, then you do the math. Um, if it doesn't have chapters, you just see the number of pages and divide in six parts. The aim with this is that students finish reading their book in six weeks and that they have discussions about each part of the book every week. Okay. We move on to the next discussion director. So the discussion director develops a list, a list of questions that the group might want to discuss about the reading assignment. And these are big pictures ideas. Um, I, I tell my students, please don't ask surface questions, okay? We don't want to know uh, I don't want to see questions like, um, what color was the shirt yeah, that uh, this character was wearing on the day of uh, the vacation started? No, not that kind of question. It has to be something that uh, will generate discussion, questions that will probably generate different opinions, okay, uh, that are going to to actually make them have a debate or, or are gonna have students exposed to different thoughts, okay? Um, I also, also say, I always tell them that the best discussion questions come from students, from their own thoughts, feelings, and concerns as they read. So I say, if you're reading something and you're surprised about it, or um, it reminds you of something, there is a reason why there's like a, like a, bell like a um there's a reason you feel connection with this part with this happening in the in the book with this character so don't ignore those highlight that part write your question right away etc um and and i think uh, i think this this tip really helps them so here i have a couple of examples uh, i took from a report from a previous a literature circle. So I would like to emphasize on the, rele the cultural le relevance of the first question. It says, what contrast can you notice between American teenagers' life in this book compared to yours when you were a teenager? Are there major differences? So as you see, students here are, are thinking deeply. They observe something in the book. They, they read about something that maybe didn't ring a bell for them, that maybe was very different from their experience as a teenager in Honduras. So this dragged their attention and they are focusing on that. They wanna talk more about that. So I say, this is the type of questions I want. And let's look at the second example. What information can you infer about Aiza's relationship with her father from what you have read up to now? Aiza is one of the characters in, this, in the book. So um, as you see, it's asking others to infer about what they're reading. And here we can have different opinions about what they believe is the relationship between this character and her father. It can be linked to um, personal experiences, to their own perspective of uh, children-father relationship, right? So in, in this way, conversations are very rich. And, and students have the opportunity of looking at different angles uh, and maybe um, drag attention to small details or big details that they didn't see at first. 
Okay, for the next role, uh, the connector. So the connector needs to find connections between the book and themselves or between the book and the wider world. So I give them this list so that they know what to, or how to connect what happens in the book. Like, has this happened? Uh, maybe you have a past experience that you connect with what happens to the characters in the book, maybe things that happen at school or in the community or stories in the news. In this part, I encourage them to, um, uh, to be aware of what's going on, like national news, international news, so that they have something to connect to. Um, similar events at other times and places. This is very important uh, when the book that they're reading has uh, an important historical background, right? They need to learn about this historical moment so that they can connect it to like what happens now, for example, in, in our nowadays. Um, other people or problems, other writings, other stories, even movies they have watched before. So uh, I have an example here. I will read it for you. And this is from the same, the same group. I have lived with people who suffer from intrusive thoughts. As a friend, you want to help them and get them out of their invading thoughts. Um, I think Davis used the best example for Aza to understand her purpose as a person, that she was real for the simple fact that she was alive. Davis didn't want Aza to compare herself to the fish anymore. And the fish is a reference to a dying creature in the book. So, um, as, as I said before, we see a connection here. We see how the student um, has probably gone through an experience that the character is going through in the book. And that also helps them uh, connect with their own feelings, right? Like uh, at an inner level. And of course, um, see if more people in their group perhaps have been through similar experiences and what can we learn from those experiences. Then the next role is the vocabulary wizard. Um, we have uh, the person who looks for new, unknown, or important words that have special meanings in the reading assignment of the week. And here we have an example. Um, I emphasize in for this role, I emphasize on the importance of having the context of the word. Depending on what the context is, the meaning can be different. So that's why I ask them to write the page number and the paragraph where they found this word, and then a definition that goes accordingly. Okay, and um, the literary luminary locates quotations in the text for the group to talk over, like important parts. Mm, think, for example, something like, what's important, it's invisible to the eye, right? So, well, this sounds like an important quote. It sounds like we can reflect more about it. So, okay, I'm gonna take note of that and I'm gonna bring it in the discussion with my group. That's what the literary luminary does. So we want to go back to those especially interesting, powerful, funny, puzzling, or important sections of their reading assignments and think about them more carefully. There, there's a reason they call our attention. So in my literary course, the literary luminary also locates literary devices and make connections to them, okay? Um, so this, is, this only happens in my literary literature course. We, of course, discuss what literary devices are. We discuss um, hyperboles. We discuss metaphors, um, irony, and so that they are able to identify them in the text. Okay, so those are the four, the five roles. I usually have the literary, luminary, and the vocabulary wizard together. Because I, uh, in my experience, groups of more than four people don't really work that well. They are too many people. Um, so four is fine. So what I do is that um, on the week that a person is gonna have the vocabulary wizard um, role, they also have the literary, luminary role. All right, so then I wanna talk a little about the importance of collaboration. Well, um, I think it's, it's uh, we can tell, right, as educators, why collaboration is important, but uh, I want to talk specifically about online and face-to-face. -face. Like first in online classes, it was very difficult to have students interact. 
Um, so using literary devices during online classes, I found um, it was a great way to have students talk, you know, and um, what I was doing back then was that they would meet individually. Um, I think their, their discussions was, were good, but then when we were face to face, I was there to see, to monitor them. So face to face is definitely better. Um, in the sense that you can you can see if they are struggling, you can see if they are doing okay, just by looking at their faces, you can tell, right? And then uh, how liter literature circles promote collaborative learning. Well, of course, when students talk about things, they have to respect diverse opinions about things. Um, they have to negotiate meanings. They have to they arrive to deeper insights of a text. And as I said, if, if um, maybe if a student brings a good idea in the group and then another brings a different idea, it's like, okay, we're building this together. We are collaborating, okay? Um, also the fact that they have to take different roles allows them to contribute uniquely every week. So if this week you are the, the summarizer, well, that's your contribution. Uh, you can participate on the others. But then the next week you get to be the connector, let's say. So then your participation will be a little bit different. And I believe like, well, uh, as I was describing the roles, I believe you could see how each role has um, focuses on a different skill, right? So I, I, think, um, I think that definitely this promotes collaborative learning. And it's, it's a benefit of course um to to develop students skills analyzing skills communication skills well talking about communication skills of course um they they promote active participation that's the heart of literary um literary circles that everybody is able to to participate so students need to be able to articulate their thoughts and to respond to the the insights of the others in a, in a good way. So I say, well, you know, you need to respect what the other person says, even if you disagree, you know, you need to agree on disagreeing. If you just can't, uh, can't agree with the other person, we have to do that every day, right? Um, and then the role of open-ended questions, I, I cannot emphasize more on the importance of open-ended questions. For this, uh, for this type of project. Well, um, as I said, they have to consider different interpretations and how can you explain your interpretation of something if it's not with open-ended questions, right? Um, with open-ended questions, they get to um, analyze character motivations, for example. They get to explore different themes in the reading. Um, and then how literature circles provide ELL students listening and speaking abilities. So for this part, of course, students need to talk. Um, actually, it involves oral uh, for macro skills, but I think listening and speaking are, are, uh, are the ones that are involved the most. Um, I, also, I also ask students to submit um, written reports, which would also which would also help them with the, with writing uh, skills, but that would be up to you, up to who your students are, up to um, your goals in class. I, I have to say, uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> um, say I have usually five, six groups every term. So then reading six, five reports every week, it takes some time, I have to say, but uh, I do it very happily. I think it's, it's, it's worth it. So um, yeah, if you want, you can do shorter versions. What I did and found that was very, very useful was to design worksheets for each role so that students know, okay, you have to you have to fulfill your role and report that in one page. Just follow this worksheet, fill it up, and no more than that. And so that that also helps. 
Um, then about cultivating critical thinking. Well, uh, as I said, they have to analyze text beyond surface level. It's not just reading comprehension, no. That's, that's not even part of the roles. Um, they have to also read the intention of the author. We talk about that a lot. Um, we talk about symbolism in the texts as well. So uh, they, they are definitely exposed to all kinds of perspectives. Um, also um, with literature circles, students have to challenge their own assumptions, right? You come to class, you come to, this, to uh, the discussion with one thing in mind, Maybe sometimes this is an assumption. Maybe you didn't consider other points of view or other things. And now that you're having this discussion, you realize that, that you were missing this part, this portion. Okay. So now you see that before you jump into conclusions, you need to consider more points of view, right? Multiple angles. Um, and I want to give uh, an example for this. I, I always do book talks before they choose their book. And um, although I, I leave it open for them to choose what book they want to read, I, I, I try to drive them so that we have uh, groups that choose historical background-based books or novels. So um, say we read the book Night, okay. Um, by Ellie Wiesel. Ellie Wiesel is a survivor of the Holocaust. So in this book, we have a lot of uh, historical background information. They need to learn about that. And so then we, we, we say, well, okay, so what happened? What happened in this period of time? Why did that happen? Do you see anything like that happening now? Maybe not the same atrocities, but maybe do you see some intolerance now towards any minority group. So we, we, we talk about that and some people say, well, no, I think, I think this group is fine. I don't think we are facing intolerance problems. And then somebody else says, well, I think we do for this particular, uh, for this minority group. So then we have these discussions and we say, well, okay, how can we prevent something like that or similar to that? How can we prevent intolerance to happen? Or if it's happening, how can we make it better? And then, um, yeah, we have, we have different ideas, wonderful ideas. Sometimes I get, I get surprised by what students are able to do when you give them the chance of doing it. So yes, uh, there's that. And then some real world applications, besides of course the fact that uh, our students are, are most likely becoming teachers. So they can use this also with, uh, you know, for professional development, use this with their colleagues or with their own students. Um, the understanding and tolerance towards other cultures and not only other cultures, towards other people, you know, um, even if even if students at UPN are mostly coming from Honduras, you know, they bring so many differences uh, among themselves. So this tolerance is very important. And well, Honduras is a multicultural country. So we also have that um, that we can apply right there in class. Uh, we also learn about relevant historical events. Uh, civic engagement and debates. I've also had students that um, connect what they read to situations that, that actually, that they happen in Honduras, you know, and we're going to have an example of that in, in, in a little bit. Um, I have this group of students who connected um, satire in, in the book Alice in Wonderland to what actually happens in Honduras. I thought it was very interesting and and, and I say, well, this is what this type of assignment does. You know, we're going beyond. We're not just staying in class. We, we are finding out what's happening. We are critically um, thinking about what's going on in our country. 
and, and well, professional development. As I said, uh, I have students who have come to me and they say, well, I want to use this activity in my school. Maybe they already teach. And so they say, I want to use this. And I, I give them ideas or they, even them, they themselves come up with ideas like, well, you know, if I do this with children, maybe instead of, um, instead of a summary, they can draw a picture. Yeah, they can draw a picture. Um, they can create a game. There are so many ways that we can adapt literature circles depending on who our students are. All right. Uh, and then some practical implementation tips that uh, have worked well with me in my experience. So model literature circle discussions prior to assigning the project. This part is crucial. It's very important. Our, our, our Honduran students are not, um, are not very used to these type of assignments where they have to read and have these big discussions and long-term. Um, so it takes some time for them to understand what is it that they have to do and how they have to do it. And they come with, I say, surface level questions. And I say, okay, look at this question. Can I answer this question just by reading at the book? Yes, okay. So then that's not the question we want, okay? We want a question that is going to have many answers that is going to foster discussion in class, okay? Uh, then the book talks, I think the book talks are very important. What I do is that I bring uh, books that I have available and I, I just show them the fact of showing them the, the physical book, the actual book, it creates a connection somehow. Uh, so I pass them around. I talk a little bit about each book. So this book is about this and that, or this is based on this period of time. And then I encourage them to, to pick one of those books. Um, yeah. And also, of course, uh, um, if they want to go for a book that is not one of the ones I'm suggesting, then I go, I say, okay, it has to be a book for adults. It has to be this long. It has to have uh, characters and, and a plot and problems. So, um, but still I give <laughs> in, the, in the next one is precisely that, as much room for choice as possible because I also want them to enjoy what they're reading. And then provide students with worksheets for each role with expanded guidelines, examples maybe, uh, so that they know they know how to comply with their role in the best way. And then have uh, reading assignment discussions in class, not out of class, not not online. If if possible, if it's during the time of the class, that's better. What I would usually do is assign one day of the week for the discussions. And then the other days we do other things, like we cover other readings that we all read. But on that day, on the discussion day, they, they get together with their group and they have the discussion about the reading assignment. And then determine evaluation criteria. Of course, uh, we want to evaluate critical thinking, uh, depth of analysis as well completedness, organization, but of course this is gonna work differently for, for each scenario. So um, yeah, if, if you are interested and if you want to see with more detail what I've done, then uh, I'll be happy to, to email that information to whoever writes me an email you know, and wants to see more about this. Okay. So, uh, as I promised, we have here students Christy Ramos and Erika Mairena. They were very brave and they decided to be part of this presentation and, and show everyone what they worked on during the first term of 2023. Hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And um, we are going to present the result of one of the literature circles that we made in the first term with Ms. Rodriguez. So we are very grateful for this space. 
can you share the presentation, please? Sure, no problem. Give me a couple of seconds. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Please let me know if you can share your screen. Erika, can you share your screen, please? I can't. Hmm. I'm going to try. It said that the host disabled the, the participant to screen sharing. We Your can hear you. Off, uh, yes, that's what I did. My question is who is going to participate in this moment? Interesting. Uh, Christy. I said, Christy. Okay, I'm going to. Me and Christy. You got to take a decision. Please proceed. It says that that is disabled to participant screen sharing. No, my question is who is going to participate in this moment? Christy. Christy, okay. Christy, I'm going to work with Christy in this moment there. Okay. No problem. Christy Ramos, is that correct? Yes. Great. Christy, could you please try to share your screen? Perfect. We can see you all. You are the only one who has access in this moment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay, so we read Alice in Wonderland and we did this uh, book report with Erica. Our topic is the absurdity in regime rules and our thesis is the Red Queen's Kingdom represented a satire of the Victorian era in England. However, 150 years later, we continue to identify that modern regimes, specifically under re regimes, behave similarly to Lewis Carroll's fictional political setting. When we read Alice in Wonderland, we can find a lot of interesting topics, but we choose this topic and this this is because uh, here in Honduras, we have enough examples to, to talk about the situation, talking in a political aspect, right? So um, we're going to compare the Red Queen that will be our character as a political reference, and we are going to compare uh, with our politicians. The first the first thing that we are going to compare is the way of rule, where the mandate is based on chaos, corruption, and injustices. And that is uh, the same story here in Honduras. Um, and this way of rule, where only uh, the ruler has benefits, or his or his family, or even close people have benefits, while the, um, the rest of the population is suffering, is suffering economic, educative and health problems. So, so this is the absurd point of being power because it's supposed that the ruler has to, has to put the needs of the people first and has to avoid the chaos and the corruption. But here in Honduras, is, it is the opposite. Uh, that is very common also in Alice in Wonderland where um, Alice, the white rabbit, the marsh hare, and we're under the, 
the the orders of the queen and this he this happened is still happening and is likely to continue happening here in our country where we have no voice no vote now we have a, a short diagram to explain more better about the five scenes that we compared to with our reality and uh, the fiction of the book. So the first one is the trial against the Knave of Hearts compared with Kevin Solorzano's trial, trials. The second one is the phrase of with the head, with the spiritual and physical death of many martyrs of our homeland. The third one is the sedes. The fourth is the color of the roses with the color of the nation now flag. And the last but not least is the Queen of Hearts army and our ruler's army. Okay, uh, here we have our first comparison. We focused on the part uh, on the book that Alice defends the knave of hearts from being accused that he had stolen the case. Uh, the scene starts with a lot of witnesses that, that present their declaration in front of the courthouse and also in front of the king and the queen. Um, the knave of hearts was being unjustly accused for uh, and also they made him responsible for a letter that he had not written. And in this moment is when Alice intervened saying that they couldn't condemn him if they didn't have enough evidence to prove that he was the guilty one. And something similar happened here in Honduras in 2014 when a case of a young university student named Kevin Solorzano that was accused of murder without enough evidence to prove that he was the guilty. He spent 2015 and 2016 on trials. Um, and also there were marches asking for his freedom, but it was until to 2017 that he was sentenced to 30 year, years in prison. Um, he spent eight years seeking his freedom, but it was until 2020, 20, sorry, it was until 2022 that the Honduran con sentencing court gave him the freedom. With these two, two examples, I can compare uh, the reality with, with the book, right? Because uh, both cases were not well investigated. Good morning, everybody. My pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, as you can see in your screen, the phrase of with the head, uh, we thought about it and we see it in two ways. When they kill your body, your 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 spirit, your fate. And um, we thought about the martyrs in our country. And we, as, as part of our investigation, we thought about uh, the, the assassination of Deta Cáceres, as you can see it in your left side of the screen. Uh, she was a defender of the natural resources in our country. She won a Nobel Prize, the Goldman Nobel Prize, which is given to the persons around the globe who defends the natural resources. So against her, um, she raised with the people of the west of her country because she wanted to save a river. A river is uh, Waserike's name. And uh, she was against the construction of a dam. So um, she fight and against the politician and the businessmen uh, in, a, in the government of our country because they wanted to do it. They were saying to the people that it was a benefit, but at the same time, it was destroying a great part, acres and acres of, of trees and pure water. So the people mm -hmm. uh, wanted to save it and support her. So one day, um, they plan. They plan the assassination of her, and it it this happened on March between the two and the third of the early morning of March in 2016. And as usually, the person who say I saw it, I I see who who killed her, an eyewitness disappeared. 
and um, and the government is not doing anything. But her daughters are still uh, fighting, and the people are still fighting for justice because they don't want this assassination is remains without be on trail. So one of the persons, another person that is on the screen also on the right right side of the screen is um, Alfredo Landa Verde. He was a recognized politician and an expert of security issues in our country. And as part of the political politician, as I said before, he found out the criminal structure was conformed by the high political class in our country. Uh, he wanted to end this corruption because he loved so much this country. He loved this. He loved so much uh, the land where he belonged. And um, he was raising his voice against all this. And I remember that one day he appears on a very important news. And uh, he said that he was sick. He was tired to see the Honduras was using as a bridge to bring uh, drugs and, uh, and use uh, as a land place uh, for, the, for the airplanes. They left the drugs, they uh, carry one money, and then they leave the country to go uh, wherever they want to go, to United, to the U.S. or Canada or wherever they want to go. So he was tired to see that they were building uh, land, uh, land places for airplanes and the people was dying in the hospitals. The school was not um, reconstructed. They were not creating new jobs for uh, for um, for teachers, and so he was so sick of this that he uh, had a, a very famous notebook where he had the name of the persons who were involved of on, of, uh, of on it and the places where they gather. The, um, uh, they have the uh, the amounts of money, the amounts of. Uh, of drug that uh, they uh, were uh, bringing to Honduras. So because he was uh, stung on the foot, he they decided to kill him. And they did it this on December 2nd, December um, 2011, the year. He was murdered by a motorcycle sicario in Tegucigalpa. So as usually happened, <laughs> the murder of this man has been, is, is and been uh, going on a trial. Um, another another thing that we found out is re, uh, that is related is the the assassination of Aristides Gonzalez, better known as a czar of against drugs in our country. He was working with the American embassy and uh, uh, fighting against uh, drugs, and uh, he was uh, um, he was quite interesting in um, destroying this this uh, political people who was working with the drug dealers. So as as as, they, as we say before, he was a song on the on the foot and they planned the assassination of him. There is also a video in YouTube, you can find it on Facebook, where uh, a person who worked with him and know him very well, knowing as a Juan Carlos Bonilla, um a he planned uh, the murder of him, the assassination of him. Of him. And um, our country is very, uh, very, uh, very sick of all this corruption, and they wanted to to end it all. The Ceres is uh, was another of the planification that they have because they knew that extradition was going to take them and and to another country. And uh, these uh, these places were having their own laws, their own banks, their own supplies, their own markets. So they wanted to divide the country in these cities, and they wanted to live there. So it was a very good planification, and they wanted to if if um, the extradition doesn't happen, uh, maybe the country will be worse than it was by that time. Another comparison that we have is the color of the roses and the color of the national flag. Um, in the books in Alice in Wonderland, we can see that the gardeners were painting the roses because uh, they made a mistake where, where, when they were planting them because uh, the queen wanted the, the roses 
were red, but they painted in white. But they realized too late, but they reacted at the same time. So they began painting the roses. And uh, this is uh, similar, uh, something that happened here in Honduras. When the president Juan Manuel Galvez established that the color of the flag will be turquoise blue with uh, the center stripe with five stars. But then in 1994, uh, the president Juan, sorry, Carlos Roberto Reina changed the color of the national flag to a deep blue just for his pleasure. So um, the politicians and the military gave uh, a big comp compliance to this uh, decree because they, they used uh, this color of the flag always. But um, it was until January 27th in 2022 with a new government that um, they returned the, the national flag uh, to its turquoise blue. And the um, last comparison is the Queen of Hearts army with our ruler's army. As we can see in Alice in Wonderland, the Queen of Hearts um, had a big uh, army to protect, to protect here. So uh, this is the same case here in Honduras when only the president and the close people of his or her has um, a, an army and we that are the population are this protector, right? So this is one of the many injustices and uh, one of the cases of corruption that has happened here in Honduras and also happened in Alice in Wonderland. As part of our conclusions, we even thought the book Alice in Wonderland contains satire and of the absurdity of the Victorian era. We see that the practices of the, ruler, the rulers are extremely similar in 150 years later in our country, completely different from England. And understanding the absurdity of the kingdom of the queen of hearts can help us understand the absurdity mm -hmm. of the actions of, the, of our governments nowadays. We found out that uh, Honduras was like a wonderland. Because in our country, they can do everything they want because money can buy anything. And um, we found out also that uh, the absolutity of the queen, it was the, uh, like the same that is happening just right now in our country. <clears throat> just to talk about a little bit of our experience doing this activity, for me, it was great because it was something new. And I really love to uh, read this book because uh, when we read, we can imagine and we can connect the thing that appears in the book and also with our reality. So as a teacher, we have to apply this type of techniques in the classroom to encourage the critical thinking in our students and also the group work. So for me, it was an interesting and uh, a beautiful activity that we did in the first term. Actually, we really enjoy it because it, it was like you read Alice in Wonderland. It's a beautiful book with beautiful characters. But when you apply it to the real world, even the, the facts happen uh, 150 or 50 or three years ago, you can find out very close relations. And when the teacher, Miss Pamela, was saying, you have to do this, I was like, oh, my God, how are we going to do this? But uh, with her help and um, the guys and all the um, the, uh, the things that she was saying to us, do this, think about this, do this, and reread uh, re this and, and, and all that kind of things, we found out that it's very good, but it, uh, an excellent technique. And we can use it with our students because the critical thinking is something that is, uh, that is delayed in a... Uh, in our society, and we need to be uh, to be proper critical thinking. But it, because then everyone can say anything they want, but critical thinking is another thing. It's a it's a very quite good things to do with our students, with the people. 
So that was all. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to both of you. Um, I just want to close the presentation. Um, just to, I just want to mention some um, potential challenges and how to solve them. Um, In-class discussion definitely help. That way you avoid things like plagiarism or misuse of technology. As for access to the books, I recommend that if you work with this with this um, project, then you assign it early so that students have time to pick their books and get those books. Um, and if you if you want, you can instead of reading a book, you can use short stories and have students read a short story and then have the the discussions the following week. And um, finally, I recommend peer evaluation as well so that students themselves can give feedback on attendance and participation from their peers. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I'm sharing my email in, in the chat in case you want me to share what I have been using for this activity in the past. Oh, just a second. Okay, so special thanks to the organizers of the conference and thank you to Christy and Erica for being here with me today. You're welcome. You're welcome, Miss, and you're welcome everybody for being with all of us this day. Thank you. I would thank like you, to uh, thank you, Miss Pamela Rodriguez, for your presentation. We have been witnessing your uh, professional and academic growth, and uh, we are so proud of you. Okay, thanks for sharing. Congratulations once again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank Ms. Pamela right, right here for taking the time and sharing this information with you. Ms. Pamela uh, was not only my teacher in the past, but also a great source of inspiration. So I first have experienced this approach with her and I can tell you how much this approach nurtures a love for reading, but also promotes um, thinking a lot and it also cultivates like a um, collaborative environment in the classroom. I would also like to thank the audience for joining us today. And I would like to invite you to go back to the swing link in order for you to access to the following sessions. Thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for joining. I hope you have a great day. Bye. Thank you. Bye everybody. Good day. Bye. -bye.